Hallelujah. Thank you, CIA, FBI, KGB. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eshaq Shaul, or Isaac Shaul. And it is an honor to have all of you here. Um, in addition to our speaker, Dr. Musavian, who just came from Iran, uh, I have the honor of also introducing to you the great singers of Vermont uh, who are going to uh, give us the honor and singing a song both to make the evening a good one and better to welcome Dr. Musabian, our speaker. The Brattleboro community is a sharing community. The Center Congressional Church is sharing their sanctuary with us as they do with many other groups. One of these groups is the Brattleboro Women's Choir, who will be performing their annual spring concert here tomorrow night at 7.30. So as a little contribution, I hope that you can all come and attend the concert tomorrow night at 7.30. The choir has graciously offered to start off our event tonight on a positive note by sharing one of their songs with us. The song of love, peace, and humanity. It is called, Last Night I Had a Strangest Dream. We accepted their generous offer because it is always good to begin an event with a beautiful song from people's hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome the Brattleboro Women's Choir. <clears throat> <clears throat>
I would have loved to hug and kiss every woman, there, but it would have taken the whole night. That would have not been fair to our speaker. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to um, uh, introduce to you our speaker. But let me just briefly mention the objective of Windham World Affairs Council. Uh, the hope of the board of Windham World Affairs Council has been to introduce timely subjects of particular interest to the community. Our subject of discussion tonight could not be more timely and more important, locally and internationally. As we all know, the world is expecting with positive and negative reactions to Mr. Trump's decision to exit the Iran nuclear agreement, the JCPOA that was signed by Iran, the US, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and China in 2015. As we also know, the leaders of European nations came to United States to plead unsuccessfully with Mr. Trump not to withdraw the U.S. from the nuclear agreement with Iran. Tonight, we are really honored to have as our speaker, Dr. Sayed Hossein Musavian, who just returned from Iran. Dr. Musavian is a former Iranian diplomat in Germany and a senior official in Tehran who served, among other roles, as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of Iran's National Security Council from 1997 to 2005, and as a spokesman <coughs> for the Iran nuclear negotiations team in its nuclear negotiation with the European Union from 2003 to 2005. He is currently a Middle East security and nuclear policy specialist at Princeton University at Withrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. <clears throat> Dr. Musavian has written many, many great articles on the subject that you will be hearing. In addition, he has written two books that are really, really great importance. The first one is The Iranian Nuclear Crisis, a memoir published by Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in June of 19, 2012. His second book, Iran and the United States, an insider view on the field past on the failed, I'm sorry, an insider view on the failed path and the road to peace, published by Bloomsbury Publishers in May 2014. If President Trump had read this book in time, and if he understood the meaning of that, what he has said and written, he would have never withdrawn from that peace agreement. Unfortunately, he had not read it, and if he had read it, I am not sure he would understand it. But ladies and gentlemen, I recommend strongly that you get a copy of that book and see what editorial exists and the comments written about uh, this book and his uh, contribution to human peace and understanding. Uh, following the discussion, uh, Dr. Musabian would be glad to answer any question uh, which is appropriate and brief. And with this humble and brief discussion, ladies and gentlemen, we are most honored to have Dr. Musabian here tonight to share with us his views and his recommendation regarding the nuclear agreement. Dr. Musabian. اگه من هم نیست، اگه لیوان آبم به من بدیم هم نمیشه Good evening It's a great honor for me to be in your 
very beautiful estate for the first time, Vermont. Great, really, to meet all of you. I would like also to thank Windham World Affair Council for the invitation and make it possible for me to meet you and talk to you. As Eshaq said, uh, three days ago, President Trump withdrew from the Iranian nuclear deal. What are the consequences is a big question for international community now. The reason is first because the deal is far beyond Iranian issue. This nuclear deal is the most comprehensive agreement ever made during the history of non-proliferation. We have many loopholes in non-proliferation treaty, NPT. That's why a country like North Korea could withdraw and make nuclear bomb. The Iranian nuclear crisis was a, an opportunity for the world powers and Iran to negotiate for 12 years in order to create a document which would contain the most comprehensive transparency measures on Iranian nuclear program and also the most intrusive inspections. Also, thank you. Sir. Also, all objective guarantees assuring that the Iranian nuclear program would never divert toward weaponization. At the end, this is 170 pages of the most detailed agreement, which would definitely be the most comprehensive protocol on transparency, intrusive inspections on non-proliferation. Killing this deal is far beyond an Iranian issue. It's a severe blow to non-proliferation because if you have heard from many officials, especially the International Atomic Energy Agency, they always have emphasized this deal is an asset, is the greatest asset for non-proliferation. Second, the reason is the issue is beyond Iran issue is the fact that we have too many problems in Middle East. Perhaps this region is the center of the most important crisis worldwide. From Iraq to Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Yemen, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and all of them. Palestinian Arab crisis for 60 years. And the Iranian nuclear crisis was and is the only crisis in this region managed through diplomacy peacefully and successfully. On doing the deal by President Trump, creating the possibility for another new crisis again in the region, in addition to too many problems, which unfortunately the world powers have not been able to resolve any of them during last decades. None of them. The third issue about the Iranian nuclear deal and President Trump pulling out of the deal is about the consequences and the impact on Iran-US bilateral relations. This relation has suffered since 1979 many misses, misunderstanding, miscalculations, misperceptions, and many other misses. 
Perhaps Iran and the U.S. have experienced the most hostile relations during the contemporary history. The most hostile diplomatic relation ever between two countries during the last 56 years. Both they distrust each other completely. There is zero trust from the American side and the Iranian and from the Iranian side and the American government. You as an American citizen definitely have heard for 40 years about the, the US reasons why they cannot trust Iran. Maybe that would be useful for me to explain why the Iranian side cannot trust the US. Perhaps some of you know Iran and the US, they had the best strategic friendly relation from 1856 to 1953, about a century. The best relations you can ever imagine. To the level that even an American was killed, or as we say, Iranians was martyred. During demonstrations, Iranians had decades ago for democracy in Iran. And still, he's buried in Iran, and Iranians, they have great respect for him. But this period was a period that the United States was supporting Iran about, uh, against the two dominant powers, UK and Russia. But from 1953, when the United States joined UK to orchestrate a coup against very popular democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953, removed him from power and installed a dictator Shah and supported Shah for 25 years. A corrupted dictator supported by the US, substituted by a democratically elected prime minister in Iran. Frankly speaking, the United States killed democracy in Iran in 1953. Right after, and it was the root causes of revolution. The main root causes of revolution in 1979 was two issues. One, dictatorship. Second, the dominance of the US. When revolution happened, just a few months after the revolution, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. And the United States supported the invasion of Iran. A war took eight years. About one million Iranians, they were either killed or injured. A war which Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons provided by the US. Chemical weapons used against Iranians killed, about, killed and injured about 100,000 Iranians. 100,000 Iranians. And this is documented, 800 pages, in US Congress, how the US provided material and technology for Saddam to use wep weapons of mass destruction. After the war, regime change policy has been the core US policy against Iran, nonstop. To be fair, I would say, during the second year of President Obama, it was not really the US policy. Because President Obama was the only US president publicly, officially, at the United Nations General Assembly in 2013, in front of the world leaders said, the US is not after regime change in Iran. And we are ready to have 
dialogue with Iran without any precondition and condition on every issue. And he publicly said, we have a respect for Iranian nation and for Iran. Other than 2013 to 2016, the U.S. has imposed always the most draconian sanctions you can ever imagine, unilaterally, multilaterally. And they have used covert war, economic war, political war, and for the first time during President Trump publicly, officially, the Secretary of State of the United States said we are after regime change in Iran very officially. Before it was the US policy, but nobody was stating. But during President Trump, they, they, they publicly say we are after regime change. <coughs> However, for the first time, despite of too many disputes and problems the two countries they have mutually, Iran and the U.S. they experienced high-level direct negotiations. In 2013, the foreign ministers of Iran and United States started direct high-level negotiations to see whether there would be a chance to manage the, 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 the disputes on the Iranian nuclear dossier. I still don't understand why, but it was a fact that American officials always, they were insisting the Iranian nuclear issue is na uh, national security threat number one to United States. I don't understand why, because Iran has never had nuclear bomb. A country without nuclear bomb, why is national security threat number one? I really don't understand. However, it was a fact. It was the US position. In just 18 months, of very intrusive negotiations, intensive negotiations between the two countries. They agreed on a very comprehensive package to resolve the crisis peacefully. The world powers, they agreed, all. United Nations Security Council passed a resolution it is one of the rare crises which all five powers they have signed. The United Nations Security Council has passed resolution to support the deal. The International Atomic Energy Agency has passed resolution to support the deal. And in 15 months after the deal, because the deal was implemented from January 2016. There is no dispute worldwide that Iran has fully complied with every commitment made in the deal on the Iranian side. International Atomic Energy Agency has confirmed for 11 times since January 2016 that Iran completely has complied with all of its commitments, zero failure from the Iranian side. But even during President Obama, implementation of the deal faced difficulties because of US primary sanctions. But it was clear Obama administration was sincere to implement the deal, there was no doubt. But President Trump, during his campaign, publicly said he would tear up the deal. And he fulfilled his promise just three days ago. Imagine the two states which have experienced the most hostile relation for about 40 years. When they negotiated for the first time at very high level directly and they agreed to resolve one of the disputes peacefully, 
and the Iranian side has fully complied. The UN Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, frequently has confirmed Iran full compliance. Atomic Energy Agency, Europeans, Russians, Chinese, all of them. And during the whole period of implementation of the deal, the U.S. failed and finally pulled out from the deal. Therefore, the impact on bilateral relations would be at least for years to come. Iranians would never trust the U.S. administration to negotiate in, on, on any other issue. Because they would say, we tried, we negotiated for two years, we agreed, international community supported, UN Security Council passed resolution, International Atomic Energy, we did all what we should do, and the U.S. at the end <coughs> failed to implement and pulled out from the deal. It's interesting for you to know the Iranian supreme leader from the day one negotiation started. He said, I'm not going to prevent the negotiations, but I tell you from now, this negotiation is baseless, useless, a mistake, because you should not and you cannot trust the U.S. administration. If you make a deal, they would break it. Non-stop, he said, from the day one, before the deal and after the deal. Because in Iran, we have two schools of thought since, since Revolution 1979. I have, I have explained in details in my book. I have explained all reasons the U.S. cannot trust Iran. A laundry list, long list. And I have explained all reasons why Iran cannot trust the U.S. I explained about the two schools of thought in the U.S., how to engage with Iran. One school of thought is pro-engagement, the other is just for confrontation and war. And we have the same in Iran. One school of thought promotes dialogue and negotiation with the U.S. and to resolve every dispute through diplomacy, negotiation and respect, mutual respect. And the other school of thought says, don't trust the U.S. They are after regime change, they are after pressure, they are after sanctions, they don't like our, our independence, they don't respect our integrity, and they have proved during the last 40 years that they would support wars against Iran, and even they would support the use of mass destructions to annihilate the country. That's why you should not and you cannot trust the U.S. now. I really don't know whether for years to come the other school of thought which have been, has been promoting dialogue with the U.S. would be able to raise again the issue after the failure of the nuclear deal. My article at Foreign Affairs just was published yesterday. I have explained the consequences, the regional consequences. It is not only bilateral, which I explained a little bit. It is not only about non-proliferation in general, which I told you because this is really the most comprehensive agreement during the history of non-proliferation, but it has regional consequences. Whether we like it or not, Iran and the U.S., they are two powers. Iran as a regional power and the U.S. as world power. They have influence in the region, presence in the region, and they have big say in every regional crisis. We are not going to get any of these regional crises to peace 
unless Iran and the U.S. they cooperate together. There are many other players, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia. It is not only Iran and the U.S. But these two countries, when we go to Afghanistan, when the U.S. announced the war on terror after 9-11, the U.S. could kick out Taliban from Kabul only and only because of Iranian cooperation. The U.S. invited Iran to cooperate. Iran cooperated. The war on terror in Afghanistan was successful in 20, 2001. And 2018, 2017, it's clear the U.S. has totally failed in Afghanistan only and only because when they entered Kabul, we had a conference in Bonn, Iran and the US, they agreed about the political structure, the new political structure in Afghanistan, a power sharing system, the rule of majority, the rights of minority, free election, this was the terms and conditions. Iran and the US, they agreed in Bonn conference in 2001. Immediately after the government was settled, the U.S. started to push Afghanistan government that Iran should leave Afghanistan. Iran left. The U.S. occupied Afghanistan for 16 years with tens of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of billions of dollars of costs and thousands of American bloods. And now 50% of Afghanistan is in the hand of Taliban. They, they, they could win Afghanistan in 2001 because of Iran-US cooperation. The US has failed after 16 years of occupation because the US didn't want to continue cooperation with, with, with Iran in Afghanistan. After Saddam, we are coming now to Iraq. Iranians, they were against uh, the U.S. war on, uh, on, on, on Iraq. They didn't like it. Even they sent a message for Americans, don't attack Iraq. However, when the U.S. attacked, Saddam collapsed. Those opponents who lived in Iran for more than a decade during Saddam, they came to cooperate with the U.S. for new Iraq. And the Iranians, they supported this cooperation. The new system in Iraq was settled again on the same basis of free election, the rule of majority, because in Iraq, Shia is in majority, in Afghanistan, Sunnis, they are in majority. The rights for minorities, power sharing, the Speaker of Parliament is Sunni, President is Kurd, Prime Minister is Shia. It was a successful cooperation, although it was completely indirect cooperation, because Iranians, they were talking to their allies in Iraq, and the Iranian allies, at the same time, they were interlocutors of the United States for constitution, for new establishment in Iraq. The constitution, everything. Iraq would be very, very successful immediately after such a cooperation if the terrorist groups, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, they would not have entered Iraq and they would not have captured Iraqi soil. But when they captured, about 30%, 40% of Iraqi soil was captured. Musa al Karkuk. And the US was leading international coalition to fight ISIS. And day by day, the situation was getting worse and worse and worse. Until the Iraqi government invited Iranian Revolutionary Guard to help them. And the American army, they know very well, without Iranian interference, Iranian military support, Iranian presence in Iraq, ISIS would have never been kicked out from Iraq. 
A body the Prime Minister of Iraq publicly said without Iran, Baghdad would have collapsed. Barzani, for the time he was President of Kurdistan of Iraq, he publicly said without Iran, Erbil, the capital of Kurdistan, would have collapsed. Every crisis in the region has the same story. Look at Yemen. Saudi Arabia has launched a war against the poorest Arab country in the world. And over two years, tens of thousands of people, they have been killed. The worst humanitarian disaster stated by United Nations. Millions of people dis displaced. And the U.S. has fully supported Saudi invasion of Yemen, fully. And publicly, just three, four days ago, publicly, the U.S. said, we have supported Saudi Arabia war on Yemen. But look how they have failed and they cannot manage. They invaded Libya. Always they blame Iran interference, hegemony, role in the region, and so you have heard a lot. But look at Libyan example. Iran had no presence, no influence at all in Libya. It's far from Iran in Africa. A Sunni country, no Shia, nothing. NATO, Europe, US, and the Arab allies, Saudi Arabia, they attacked in order to remove, let's say, a dictator, Gaddafi. Gaddafi collapsed. And Libya is engulfed with instability for four or five years. And nobody can do anything to save Libya. I really appreciate President Obama when at the last months of his presidency, he publicly said, I wish we have not attacked Libya. It was a big mistake. You can attack, then what after? Now is the heaven for terrorists. Saudi Arabia cannot do anything. The US cannot do anything. Europe cannot do anything. Al-Qaeda is there. They have occupied part of uh, Libya. Yemen has become the heaven for Al-Qaeda. Can you imagine Syrian crisis, which really is one of the worst, worst crises in, in at least a century. 110,000 terrorists have been organized by the countries you know to enter Syria to bring a regime change. Billions of dollars. As, as Vice President Biden said in 2014 in, at Harvard, in his speech at Harvard, he said, our problem in Syria is with our own allies. He named Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Emirate. He publicly, officially said, they are sending tons of weapons and tens of billions of dollars to support terrorists to bring regime change. Because the U.S. always has claimed, I mean, the U.S. administration, they are fighting terrorists. But I'm sure some of you, at least, you, you watched three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when Amir of Qatar met President Trump at White House. At the beginning, normally, they have just two, three minutes for TV. And President Trump, in front of Amir of Qatar, said, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, they have been supporting terrorists for years and years, but now they promise not to do, and it is good they are buying arms from us. I mean, look, the U.S. president officially, in front of seven billion people in the world, confessed that these countries have been supporting terrorists, but no problem because you buy arms from us, that's fine. However, whether we like it or not, 
Middle East is at the verge of collapse. Too many crises. Lack of diplomacy. Lack of multilateral cooperation. Iranian nuclear issue was perhaps the only crisis which we had multilateral cooperation. The US, Russia, China, Europe, all. Unanimously they negotiated with Iran and they agreed. But you cannot find multilateral cooperation in any other regional crisis. Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, even fight on ISIS. You cannot f really see a serious, genuine multilateral cooperation to fight the terrorists. That's why I would say President Trump's policy to fight Iran in the region, this is his official policy, publicly said, after withdrawing from the nuclear deal, definitely would make the region less safe. Definitely would not help for crisis management in this region. Definitely because when the regional power and the world power is going to fight each other in such a stable region with too many crises, you can imagine how the situation would get worse. Therefore, I believe we are in very, very worried situation. There is a new alliance between Saudi Arabia, Israel and President Trump to fight Iran. Therefore, Iranians also, they would try to have their own allies from Iraqi government to Syria, to Russia, to Hezbollah. They would, they would try to have their own allies in order to fight the US. This is something I, re I really wish we, we, that the US administration would have continued diplomacy with Iran after the nuclear deal. Iranian supreme leader, despite of all pessimism, which frequently said we cannot trust the US, but publicly he said before the deal, he said if we reach a deal, and if the US complies sincerely, correctly, we would be ready to negotiate on other issues. Therefore, the nuclear deal could be a beginning for Iran-US regional dialogue. No doubt, if these two countries, they would shake hands to support diplomacy, they, their allies also would come to, 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 to such a negotiation and definitely we would be able to resolve at least part of the regional crisis in the Middle East. But now, President Trump withdrawing from the deal, he has really damaged the non-proliferation in general and I'm afraid if Europeans, they cannot secure the economic benefit of Iran, which has been already, they have been committed within the deal. If Iranians are not supposed to get any benefit from this deal, I'm afraid they are not going to stick with the deal. Because in this deal, Iran is the only country has accepted too many limits on its nuclear program, which no other member states of non-proliferation treaty, 180 countries, they are member, no country has ever accepted such a limits. But Iranians, as a confidence building measure, they accept it. And the level of transparency Iranians are committed is the highest level of transparency any country already has accepted on its nuclear program. Therefore, you can imagine what would be the consequences if even Europeans, they fail to uh, deliver the economic benefits which Iranians 
they are supposed to receive from this deal. Bilateral relations, we should pray. If there is going to be more hostilities, it would be short of war. Everybody now is afraid about possible war. And you remember the U.S. war in Iraq, the U.S. war in Afghanistan, seven, eight thousand Americans, they were killed, seven trillions of dollars were spent. And the countries both are in mess. Terrorists are there. Stability is zero. The outcome is minus zero. And you can imagine war with Iran would be tenfold, the consequences. I hope there would be no war. I hope Americans would encourage the government to go for diplomacy. I hope the U.S. Congress would do something to prevent this confrontational strategy of President Trump. And I hope uh, the United Nations Security Council, the five members, they would do really something to secure again the deal, which, because there is a resolution. And I hope there would be a chance for the U.S. and Iran to continue the type of dialogue and negotiations they experienced 2013 to 2015. I'm very pessimistic, but at least I can hope. I think it's uh, time to stop and leave the time for you in case you have any question. Rush <clears throat> over uh, there. Uh, hold, hold your hand up high so I can see and I'll come with the mic. Uh, I think over there was first. Please make your question brief so everybody has a chance to ask a question. There may be, I, mean, I follow the oil markets, you didn't mention oil. And there may be another deal going on behind the scenes that we don't know much about that to, uh, when the Ramco comes on the market in a few months, it uh, benefits Saudi Arabia, benefits the United States, the markets, it benefits uh, Europe, Total, Exxon, uh, Dutch, uh, Shell. Shell, and uh, Chevron, all the rest. It makes a, a lot more money than the war, than if there were a war. So this may be where it's headed, this other deal. And Trump is supposed to be good at making deals. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's grotesque, but this could be going on. And I wonder if you would speak to it. No, I agree with you. Um, the core US strategy in the Middle East since 1950, at least two, two three years ago, has been oil, oil, oil. But that's why the U every U.S. administration, they didn't care to support dictators, corrupted regime from Shah to Mubarak to even the, the, these kings in the region. They, they never cared about human rights, democracy, only oil. That's fine. But it's two, three years the U.S. Is, has become independent. They don't need oil from the region. And the US now is going to be gradually number one oil exporter worldwide. Therefore, if there is a war, the oil price would increase. It's clear. Whether this is really the reason behind such a confrontational strategy, you may be right. I hope not. Saudi Arabia, Yes, they would benefit. Europe, they would lose. Japan, they would lose. China would lose. South Korea would lose. I mean, perhaps other than these Gulf countries, 
Of course, Russia would win because Russia is the big exporter of oil. And it could be one of the uh, um, major issues behind these policies. We have one question over here. Uh, you haven't mentioned very much the elephant in the room, which is Israel, and what role they have played in this, and what role, I mean, Israel serves as a kind of proxy for the United States, and what role they will play now in this situation. They play role number one. During President Obama, Israel was not successful. I mean, when I say Israel, I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about the extremism. I'm talking about people like Netanyahu. We have in our own country extremists. We have here in the US extremists. We have in Israel extremists. And the problem is because of extremism. They tried to convince President Obama to go to war against Iran, but he didn't. <clears throat> they didn't like Iranian nuclear crisis to be managed peacefully, but President Obama didn't listen. President Obama did everything to bring to a state solution. John Kerry did everything, but Bibi Netanyahu resisted. Now everything is completely different with President Trump. And I'm afraid that the Israeli Prime Minister has more influence in White House than the Secretary of State of the United States, and even the Congress. And this is really a big issue on the Iranian side. The Iranian policymakers Iranian elites always have been complaining the U.S. policy in the Middle East is based on the interest of Israel, and that's all. But these days after President Trump, the situation is so bad. I mean, and the Iranian public opinion, I tell you, just one short story. When, I, when last week I was in Iran, when I was coming to airport by a taxi, we don't have Uber in Iran, we have Snap. There's a company say Snap. And the taxi driver recognized me. He said, oh, you are Ambassador Musavian? I said, yes. You are going to US? I said, yes. Give my best regard to President Netanyahu. I said, Prime Minister Netanyahu is Israel, you are making... He said, no, 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 no. Prime Minister Trump should go to Jerusalem, and President Netanyahu should go to White House. It is a taxi driver in Iran. And I was really shocked. Uh, we have one question in the back. Soon after President Trump uh, went through the United States, It is uh, easy because Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Emirate, we have six countries member of Gulf Cooperation Council, Arab countries neighbor of Iran. Bahrain is practically now a state of Saudi Arabia. Emirates, Saudi Arabia, they are leading the regional confrontation with Iran. Other countries, Qatar, you, everyone knows the tension, the problem between Qatar and Saudi Arabian Emirate. And Qataris, they have a better, much better relation with Iran compared to Saudi Arabia. Oman always have been trying its best to bring peace between Iran and the US. It is Gulf country, Arab country, Sunni country, member of Gulf Cooperation Council, but they have invested years and years and years to bring peace between Iran and the US. 
Kuwaitis, they really don't like war against Iran because they know the consequences. Saddam invaded Iran, but right after the invasion of Iran, Saddam invaded Kuwait. Kuwaitis, they understand what is war. They really don't want war. That's why they, are, they have a no, relatively much better diplomatic relation compared to, to even Emirate. Therefore, there is a clear dispute within the Persian Gulf. Three countries one side, three countries the other side. But you are reading the WikiLeaks from 2005. Every US administration has been invited by Saudis to attack Iran. Secretary of State John Kerry two, three times, he said, in every meeting I was with Saudis and Emiratis and Egyptians, they were insisting you should attack Iran. Therefore, this is not something new. From 2005, these countries, they have been trying to drag the US for another war in the region. But now, I believe this is not only these two countries, I believe Israel, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, they are doing everything to provoke President Trump to drag the US in a new war in the region. Thanks for your patience. Next question. Sir, a follow-up on the other question about Israel. It seems to me, as of yesterday, that the war has started. That Israel, with the blessing of the United States, has attacked Iranian troops in um, in Syria, and I. I I'm just wondering how far the Iranians are going to allow Israel to lead this war. Is, is there a point at which the Iranians will strike back at Israel, or does Israel have a free hand since they have the American support? I think President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, thinks he has the best opportunity as far as he has Gerald Kushner in, in White House and President Trump because he thinks this is the time to push the U.S. to attack Iran. What he is doing in Syria, he is trying to provoke Iran for retaliation. And then everybody would say Iran has attacked Israel. Iran has past the red line, and the US now should attack. Israel, during last year, has invaded Syria 150 times. Not only one, 150 times. And recently, they are trying to attack Iranian bases in Syria in order to provoke Iran to retaliate and then tell President Trump, now is your time. I personally believe Israel, they do not want to engage direct war with Iran because they know they cannot handle it. They know very well. Iranians also, they don't want to war with Israel, neither with Israel, nor Saudi Arabia, nor other countries. If they are in Syria, because Syria has a legal government recognized by United Nations, and the Syrian government has invited Iran to uh, go to Syria to fight 110,000 terrorists inside their country. But who has invited the United States to, to, to go to Syria? No one knows. Who has invited Syria, uh, Israel to attack every day, day and night Syria? No one knows. I don't believe the war has started. I believe the provocation strategy of Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu now has started intensively in order to, to push and to put President Trump in a situation that he has no choice other than to defend Israel for defending Israel to attack Iran. Yep. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. You had it first. Here you go. First off, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I think it was very enlightening. In regard to the problem of the elephant in the room, not the gorilla, but the elephant, is the one element that you didn't bring to the fore, which I think is very important. And that is, this is a religious war that has been going on for several centuries, many centuries. <clears throat> right now, you're sitting under the hateful sign of the cross if you're a Muslim. I think that the big issue here is religion, not oil, uh, not economics, but in the God that they all everybody different believes in differently. And I think it would be interesting for you to touch on that point. I really don't believe religion is the issue. As an Iranian, Iranians really have no problem with Jews, with Christians. They have lived together for centuries. Shia Sunni in the region, they have a history of over 1,000 years of living together. We have Sunnis in Iran for 1,400 years. We have Shia in Saudi Arabia. We have Shia in Iraq. We have never had Sunni Shia war. I wasn't talking about the Iranians. I was talking about the Americans. Americans? I, 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 you should tell me, you know, because I really don't know whether the, the issue for the US administration is ideology. I mean, I would be happy to be educated from you because this is something I have never heard from American scholars. Well, if you, if you take upon yourself the thought that there are a group of Christians that believe that... The yes, but they are in very minority. Unfortunately, now they have a big role. But in the U.S., overwhelming majority of Americans, they, they really don't want to use ideology to... to it doesn't take many crazy people. <laughs> we have one question in the middle. Here we go. Yeah, the Tea Party. <laughs> okay, right now there's a lot of darkness in the room. Uh, you brought up a lot of information that sounds pretty scary. So why don't you paint another picture? If things don't go the way that many in the room might think it would, where would you like to see it go from an Iranian perspective? On what? Instead of war, oil, conflict, no, as an Iranian, first of all, uh, I have been advoca advocating lessening tension between Iran and the U.S. for many, many years. And all I'm doing, writing lectures, trying to minimize the hostility, animosity, and the tension between Iran and the U.S. Even if they don't want to have diplomatic relations, that's fine. But hostility, animosity, war is something we should be really afraid of. Should be a red line. And the regional issues, I think we have regional powers. They are in the region, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt. You cannot change geography. And they are doomed to live forever. What is the problem the region is facing with so many difficulties? You can have a long list of problems. But I think the most important one is the lack of regional cooperation system. Look at Europe, World War I, World War II, Germany, France, UK, you know the history. But Europeans, they could manage history of hostilities and wars by establishing a regional cooperation system in Europe, European Union.
I firmly believe we need a regional cooperation system for security, peace, stability between Iran, GCC, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. Eight countries around this Persian Gulf. They need to have a regional cooperation system which would address every concern of every member from interference to hegemony to regime change to terrorism to organized crime whatever this cooperation system should be very comprehensive economic political security cultural like like what you see in europe and some other regional cooperation it is not even you have here in, in with the, between the us Mexico and, and, and uh, Canada. This is the second issue. And the third issue, the rivalries between world powers in the region. I mean, the world powers, they have their own issues. The US from one side, Russia from the other side, Chinese are quiet, but Europeans, they interfere too much. UK, they have military bases. France, they have military bases. The United Nations Security Council, the five permanent members, they are responsible for security, peace, stability in the world. They are the highest body internationally responsible to establish peace, security, and stability. Go to every crisis, you would see their hand creating the crisis. Right here. I'm curious, in, in light of some of the answers, in light of some of the answers that you did, Provide, uh, why did we not include Israel in the list of regional cooperators? The reason is that Israel is not going to give up its nuclear bomb. It is a fact. All other countries, they are members of non-proliferation treaty. Every other country in the Middle East is member of non-proliferation treaty except Israel. No other country in this region has nuclear bomb except Israel. And we have nuclear weapon free zone resolution from the early 1970s by United Nations Security Council. For 50 years, this resolution, this initiative has failed because Israelis are not ready to discuss the nuclear bomb. If you can convince them, welcome. Okay, we have one question right over here. Yes, um, I have a quick question, I think. Um, what impact do you think this will have on Rouhani's leadership, oh, given that he supported the deal and now the U.S. has pulled out? As I told you, uh, we have two school of thought in Iran. Rouhani is among those who believe lessening the tension, hostilities, through dialogue and negotiations. He invested a lot. It was, I think, a great success. The US pulling out definitely would be a damage for the cred credibility in Iran. But the deal still is not dead yet. We need to wait to see how the other five, because we have P5 plus one, five permanent members plus Germany, or EU three plus three. Now one is out, but the other five are in. Would they be able to deliver to preserve the deal? This is open question. Uh, one question right here. Uh, yeah. You, you talked earlier that there is the group that wants war in Iran as well as there is in this country. My question is, what do you think it will take, like with Japan when Roosevelt you know, knocked off the oil and they sanctioned the oil, that pushed the war 
section into power and they did it. What do you think it would take in Iran to push them into power? I think more pressures, more sanctions, more bullying, more threatening Iran would rad radicalize Iran more and more and more. Because then the question would be about the integrity of the country. It is not sacred, it is public. That because of President Trump threats, Israeli threats, Saudi threats, it is public that some fractions, some personalities, some politicians in Iran publicly are calling uh, and saying we need a president from Revolutionary Guard. It is not secret, it is public. Because every Iranian, if they feel the country is under threat, the integrity is under threat. And if uh, countries like Israel, Saudi Arabia, President Trump are going to attack, then definitely they would welcome the militaries to take over in order to defend their integrity and independence. This is, this is an equation, you know. One question right here. Um, most discussion on this topic is involves people taking sides. They choose one side, again the other side, and they don't make any progress. If somebody could say, while I am right, you are not wrong, which means they're willing to listen to the other person. The other person has genuine humanitarian concerns. Everybody is human. Even the enemy, so-called, is human. So if we can begin to think about what, what do you really want in relationship, I'm right, but you're not wrong, I'm listening, and, and I expect the same thing from you. Maybe there could be a cooperation, yes. not only in the countries you mentioned, but even with Israel, even with this issue that Israel has the bomb because a lot of countries in Europe have bombs too, and they got together. No, in general, I, I, I fully agree with you. If there is going to, 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 to have peace everywhere, we need to understand the concerns of every country, every party. We need to be realistic. We need to be fair. We need to address the security concern of the countries. If Saudi Arabia is concerned about its security, says Yemen is my backyard, we have to understand Saudi Arabia has a security concern in Yemen. If there is going to be a solution, we need to help Saudi Arabia. We cannot fight Saudi Arabia by provoking Yemen to fight Saudi Arabia. I mean, I, I have nothing to add on what you said. One question over here. Americans are not used to having their government hijacked. Uh, other countries have experienced it often. Is it important that those of us who are concerned about what's just happened communicate it to people in your country? Or is that a, a nice idea with little impact? I really don't know uh, what I'm watching during the last 10 years of my stay here in the US. The US is really a big power, no doubt about it. But what I am surprised about the foreign influence in the, the U.S. foreign policy. You have read a lot of articles in Washington Post, New York Times, how, for example, Saudi Arabia, Emirates spending money in Washington for lobbying and making policy change the U.S. policy. It is not, I mean, you can read I don't know whether you saw a tweet from an advisor of K 
King of uh, Emirate when President Trump sacked Secretary Tillerson, he tweeted Abdullah Khaliq. He tweeted said, and said, this is, this today is a big day in history because UAE was successful to remove Secretary of State of United States. And before this tweet, it was published in your media, big media, how Emirates, they spend money in Washington to remove Secretary Tillerson. Because he didn't, war, he didn't want war. He was supportive of the nuclear deal. Therefore, whether in this way the US policy is hijacked or not, I really doubt it. However, I, I, I agree, I mean, I, I really believe it is not a misunderstanding in the US about, only misunderstanding in the US about Iranian side. Also, there is misunderstanding on the Iranian side about the US. Definitely, there is mutual misunderstanding. They don't understand each other. Four years, lack of relations. With too many interferences. And there are many other countries, they don't like Iran-US rapprochement. Their strategic interest is confrontation between Iran and the US. It is not only Israel or Saudi Arabia, you know what I mean. That's why uh, if we can help people's to people's relations. I mean, American people with Iranian people, they have more interaction together. Tourism, cultural activities, whatever. University, academic, students, in order to have a better understanding about the realities. I hope that would be helpful. Uh, right here, we have a question. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation of, of uh, what I perceive as a uh, very uh, Iranian uh, view of the situation. Uh, I would like to mention, though, that uh, oh, yeah. I have worked with the IAEA, and I think that everyone in this room should be aware <clears throat> that depending on their inspections is depending on a very weak read. Uh, and I also would point out that the agreements were never presented to the U.S. Congress to see if the government would agree with them. These were signed by executive order by President Obama. So my question follow on is, uh, do you see the present negotiations going on leading anywhere, even if it is from a different starting point? The present negotiation between which countries? Uh, between Iran and the United States. There is no negotiation. There is no negotiation between the U.S. and Iranian administration after President Trump took office. Everything was completely caught. Have we one in the back? When you refer to the many quote, invasions of Syria by Israel, you also including in that the dozens of times that Israel has delivered humanitarian goods, medical aid, consumer goods, food and diapers, or escorted back children who've had surgery in Israeli hospitals, or wounded Syrians who've come across the border to have their medical care in Israel? I read your Wall Street Journal detailed report. All this medical treatment has been for terrorists. Wall Street Journal published a detail that these terrorist groups have been treated medically in Israel. It is your papers. I really don't know anything. But I have read a lot of American credible big papers like Wall Street Journal. For the first time, Wall Street Journal published a report saying that this terrorist group, they have been injured and they have been med medically treated in Israel. One question up front here. Salam alaykum, Mr. Avion. Welcome to Bradbury. I have a question. Uh, 
about the U.S. invasion in Afghanistan. I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. invasion was just to eliminate terrorism in Afghanistan and go after Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is gone uh, and the Taliban were weak. So they were looking after Osama bin Laden. They found him, they killed him. Uh, but now we are facing a proxy war between these uh, powers of countries like I don't know, people think about U.S. invasion in Afghanistan and also Iranians helping Afghans to fight uh, the U.S. and so other, other countries like Saudi Arabia. What do you think uh, would this uh, impact the Afghan and Iranian uh, relations? I really don't believe there is a very important a factor of supporting the other countries. If Taliban has been supported, ideologically, money, Taliban has been founded by Saudi Arabia. And Hillary Clinton in a hearing pop officially said the US, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan founded Taliban. It is Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State of United States in the Congress. And if you are from Afghanistan, you know many, many madrasas in Pakistan for religious education of Taliban and Taliban school of thought. And you know all these schools are funded by Saudi Arabia. If you read uh, pre President uh, Obama interview with Atlantic 2016, he said Saudis, they have invested tens of billions of dollars to educate e extremism, Talibanism in the region and beyond. Taliban is extreme Sunni. Iran is a Shia country. Talibans, they killed Iranian diplomats in Afghanistan. What can be motive for Iran to support extreme Sunni in its neighbors? See, the US has been really the sole power in Afghanistan, foreign power in Afghanistan for 16 years. Tens of thousands of US troops, they have been there. But Taliban is not a group, you are Afghani. Taliban is not a group. Taliban is part of Afghanistan nation. That's why they cannot defeat. It is different with a, a terrorist group with 5,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 members. Taliban is an ideology. Saudis, they have invested for 50 years, 40 years. You have hundreds of thousands of youth educated like Taliban, Wahhabism. It is not only in Afghanistan, it is not only in Pakistan, it is in Africa, it is in Egypt, it is everywhere. It is in the US, it is in Europe. Therefore, I, I really don't believe uh, Russians, they have contact with Taliban but I don't believe they are really giving money, weapon to fight the US, for what? If Taliban is going to take over Afghanistan, Iran would be the first country to suffer. Because then the extreme Sunnis, they would take over Iranian neighbor to fight Shia. Uh, we have one question here. It seems like you, when you're mentioning all of the motivations of the different countries, but doesn't it in fact come down to the motivations of the individuals involved and those who seek to earn the money, as the gentleman was pointing out with the Aramco deal? What, in your opinion, like, who are some of the individuals involved? And, and what about the role of the Iranian-American community here in the United States, the expat? community, do they play a role in promoting different policies? Um, and what do you think Netanyahu's motivation, his end game is? 
When I'm talking to many, many American Jews, I see overwhelming majority of Jews in the U.S. They do not like Netanyahu's policy. Overwhelming majority of Jews, they like two-state solution. They want peace with Israelis. They be with Palestinians. They don't want to demonize Palestinian nation forever. One of friends said about ideology, Netanyahu is really, uh, I think, hostage by, by extreme ideology. About Iranian community, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to say it is a big asset for peace between Iran and the U.S. We have too many good people like Ishaq, well-educated, friend of Iran, friend of the U.S. But neither the U.S. nor Iranian government, they, they have never tried to use this asset. None of them. They are totally isolated and they have almost close to zero role in Iran-US conflict. We have hundreds of thousands of Iranians, Americans. And they, they love US. They live here. And Iran is their motherland. Definitely they want peace, no doubt. Which is in the interest of the US and Iran both. But their role is almost really very close to zero. I'm, I'm really sorry to say. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one person here. About a week or so ago, Netanyahu said that his Secret Service had, had proof that the Iranians had um, uh, uh, secret development labs that the, uh, that the, that the um, uh, inspectors were not aware of. And um, what, what do you think of that whole comment? First of all, um, IAEA, Europeans, they all said what Netanyahu presented is nothing new. It is the documents already IAEA they had before the deal. Europeans also publicly said it is nothing new. There are claims, documents accusing Iran after 2002. However, the IAEA proved for about 13 years and they investigated all of these documents. No other country during the history of IAEA has ever given access to the IAEA inspectors like Iran has given during the last 15 years. The biggest budget of IAEA is going for inspection in Iran. And we have a friend here from IAEA, he would agree with me since 2003 the IAEA every three months has issued a report saying there is no evidence of diversion in Iranian nuclear program toward weaponization. And based on international rules and regulations, the IAEA is the sole credible responsible agency to assess the nuclear program of other countries. Israel is not police of nuclear in this world. And the US intelligence assessment published in 2007 and 2011, both says after 2003, Iran has stopped following nuclear weapon program. 
Therefore, all these documents uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu raised was something in order to create uh, good ground in international public opinion, specifically in the U.S. for President Trump to withdraw from the deal. Uh, one more back here. I'm very impressed with the talk, but there is uh, something I couldn't really get out of my mind. Uh, when you refer to the invitation that the Iranian troops had from the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, uh, I would like to know your characterization of that regime and the atrocities committed against civilians, barrel bombing, so on and so forth. Is this simply Western propaganda, or is this a question of um, geopolitics coloring what is happening? I agree with you. I understand the reference to terrorists because I know the democratic forces uh, within Syria uh, were marginally, uh, 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 marginalized and that the uh, Saudi support and others, ones you may refer to as terrorists. But I would just like your characterization of the regime, the Russian involvement in the regime, and the Iranian involvement, and whether in fact they're responsible for a major humanitarian crisis. Otherwise, I'd love your presentation. No, see, when unrest started in 2011 in Syria, I think Assad made a big mistake to treat the demonstration violently. Very clear. He made a big mistake. But the number of death, refugees, and displaced people in Syria is extremely too high, nine million people. To be fair, if you are president of Syria, even if you are dictator, right? If 110,000 terrorists from all over the world, from the US, Chechnya, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, everywhere are mobilized, exported to your country, to bring your regime change. What do you do with your army? You fight them. When tens of thousands of Syrian army is going to fight tens of thousands of foreign terrorists in their land, who is the victim? Citizens, civilians. And they both are responsible. Why the, the crisis, we didn't have the same crisis in, in Bahrain? 80% are Shia, right? And the government of Bahrain treated them very violently. But why we don't have such a toll of death and destruction? Because there is no foreign terrorist in Bahrain or foreign intervention other than uh, Saudi Arabia police or military is not, is not important. Why we don't have and we didn't have the same situation in Yemen? Why we have the same situation in Libya? Because of the foreign terrorists in Libya. I mean, this is a very important issue to understand. If in a country, the problem is between government and opposition, but from their own country, the number of toll is limited. The, 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 the number of killed or injured are limited. But when tens of thousands of terrorists are coming from all over the countries, then you cannot stop. That's why the problem in Yemen, uh, in Libya and Syria, specifically Syria, is more than humanitarian problem and I, I really don't know if you were instead of President Assad what you would do if you have 100,000 foreign terrorists in your country. What you would do? You would welcome them? You would deliver the government to them? But you agree that he was bombing and killing and violently trying to stop the Arab Spring from developing Syria. If I were Assad, 
and if I have a moral, a moral heart at all, I would. No, if I if I were Assad at the beginning, definitely I would compromise with the opposition. I would not attack them. I, I would not kill them. But it was two, three months at the beginning. It was a big mistake, I told, I said. If I were him, I would invite them. I would have a, a power sharing government. I, I would give them ministerial posts in order to have, I mean. But what after three months, four months happened in Syria was the export of bunch of terrorists from Turkish border coming like what they entered Iraq, captured Kirkuk, Mosul, you know. They were not Iraqis, and they were not Syrians. That's why really the crisis went to somewhere you couldn't control. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we have time limit. The church management want us to evacuate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and have a good night, everyone. The only thing I can like to ask is the Iranian people live with the poetry of Rumi, and regardless of what goes on in the White House or in Iranian government leaders, elite, the Iranian people live and function with the philosophy of love, peace, and harmony that Rumi has taught us. And with that, I thank Professor Ambassador Dr. Musabian for coming here and sharing his talk with us. Thank you.